Good morning to all. Here we are again for another session of our Aberlin Linguist Online program. And today we are honored to have with us Professor Falk Hutig, who is going to talk to us about how learning to read changes evolutionary ancient visual abilities. Professor Falk Hutig has a bachelor and a master's degree in psychology from the University of Edinburgh, Scotland, and a PhD also at the Red Ball, I mean, at York University, sorry. Uh, and he's a senior investigator at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics in Imaga, Netherlands. And since 2019, he's also a full professor of psycholinguistics and cultural cognition at Red Ball University. He is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Cultural Cognitive Science and the effect of cultural inventions, in particular reading and writing on the mind and brain is one of his main research interests. So at the end of Professor Hutig's talk, we'll receive, you can already write your questions on the chat and then we'll be happy to send the questions to Professor Hutig who can answer at the end. Thank you very much. Professor Hutig, it's an honor to have you here today. You can start your talk. Thanks, Marcos. Thanks for the introduction and also the invitation. I'm actually a big fan of this lecture series. So I've been following it for a while and it's a great honor to be the next in line here today. So I will share my screen now. Could you just um, confirm that you can see the screen? Yes, yes, it's online, it's okay. All good. Okay, so the topic of my talk is how learning to read changes evolutionary ancient visual abilities. And in some ways, it's the flaws in our writing systems that have the biggest impact on how learning to read changes visual processing in our minds and brains. And this has to do with the shapes of the written characters that make up the scripts. Most shapes of the letters of the English alphabet go back all the way to the hieroglyphs of ancient Egypt, which have their origin in pictographic writing with some Phoenician, Semitic, and Greek influences thrown in. So for example, if you turn the capital letter A upside down, you may get an idea of its original shape in Egypt, a triangular head with two horns to pick the come of an ox. Capital B descends from the, her from the hieroglyph for house, turn capital B 90 degrees clockwise, and you get closer to the shape of ancient Egyptian houses, two room houses made of mud bricks with flat reed roofs. Other resemblances are even more obvious. H is based on the pictogram for fence, I originates from arm, K from hand, N from snake, the wavy W from the hieroglyph for water, and O from eye. Further developments are even more recent. Writing con conventions varied hugely during the Middle Ages. The similar shape of I and J is explained by that there used to be different shapes for the same letter. And it's only in the 14th and 15th century England that I and J started to be used to distinguish different sounds. Rapid handwriting more often resulted in letters losing their distinctive features. It has been suggested that lowercase Q, which was not part of the old English alphabet, may have evolved from lowercase p because neat legible handwriting turned into chicken scroll with hurried writers. More likely to be correct is the explanation that French scribes in England in the period of Middle English introduced lowercase q because they tended to prefer the French spelling of cognates, that is words in different languages that have a similar meaning and pronunciation. So this way, the old English question spelled with CW became, became, the, became the spelling of question that we have today and the spelling of CW generalized to QU, changing also the CW spelling of quick to the, to the day spelling of quick. 
Now, the history of the alphabet then explains the shape of the written letter symbols in use. It turns out that some shapes, especially the differences between shapes that stand for distinct letters, are more than a little suboptimal for our brains. The ancient architects of what may be called more accurately the Latin, Greek, Phoenician, Semitic, Egyptian alphabet did not know that our brains have great difficulty to deal with mirror images. The shape of a letter in the mirror appears almost identical to untrained people if it is a 180 degrees reflection around image axis. The mirror image of the lowercase letter B is the lowercase letter D. The mirror of lowercase P the lower is lowercase Q. So mirror image discrimination is actually a special form of our natural difficulty to keep left and right apart. Mirror image discrimination is a crucial ability for being able to read English and other languages. As we all know, the left and right sides of any object look inverted in the mirror unless they are fully symmetrical. You don't need any mirror image discrimination skills for letters such as A, H, I, M, O, T, U, V, W, X, and Y, because they look the same in the mirror. All the other letters of the Latin alphabet appear reversed in the mirror image. This is not a problem if the mirror image is a non-existing letter. If you cannot keep uppercase E apart from its mirror reversed image, you're fine because such a distinction is not crucial in reading English. The situation is different if the mirror image is a different legal letter. So if you cannot distinguish lowercase p from lowercase q, or that lowercase b is different from lowercase d, you are in trouble. Words like bad and dad will look identical to you. And it turns out that being unable to distinguish B and D, something called mirror invariance, is the normal state of affairs that we have inherited from evolution. Mirror image discrimination is not natural to us. Mirror invariance is the reason why children, when they start to learn to write letters and numbers, often go from right to left with all the letters and numbers reversed. This can quite distress some parents when they first notice it in their kids. So the child may speak well and fluently, has quite a neat handwriting, but continues stubbornly to reverse the letters. The one early theory popular in the beginning of the last century assumed that people are storing visual images such as letter, letters in one orientation in one side of the brain and a mirror reversed version in the opposite one. Researchers in the last century thought that the mirror images stored in the right brain are usually suppressed because the dominant left brain takes over and accesses the correct visual form. In young children, however, the story went, left brain dominance had not yet been established with the result that the right brain often enough managed to spit out the incorrect mirror image before the left brain got its act together. Even today, many teachers and parents believe incorrectly that mirror writing in children is an early indication of dyslexia or means the child is left-handed. Most researchers today believe that our brains simply do not code in memory any differences between mirror image views. According to this account, mirror invariance is simply part of, evol of our evolutionary baggage. Our brains have a natural tendency to eliminate left-right orientation when processing and storing visual input, something that helps us greatly, for example, to recognize faces by left and right profiles. So you've probably seen the Statue of Liberty, if not in real in New York City, then on a picture. But can you remember which arm she's raising to hold the torch above her head? I certainly couldn't when I tested myself on this. I guessed it might be her right arm because most people are right-handed, which turns out to be correct. 
But unless you live in New York or encounter the statue for other reasons frequently, you are unlikely to have memorized the correct left-right orientation. As Homo sapiens, we are not alone in finding mirror image discrimination hard. Mirror invariance is something we share with many other species. So it has been observed in animals as diverse as monkeys, rats, pigeons, octopuses, and fishes. A plausible explanation for the existence of mirror invariance is that the natural environment is mostly indifferent to left and right differences. So it has not been adaptive for Homo sapiens and many other animals to evolve making such a distinction. In contrast, it's very adaptive for animals in their natural environments to intend and respond equally well to either side of the body. Humans and other animals must be able to recognize visual objects in many different viewing conditions, and it is adaptive to do that very quickly. It's crucially important because most encounters with visual objects in the natural world are entirely unique. It is extremely rare that we find ourselves in exactly the same visual situation twice. And objects need to be recognized despite appearing in new visual contexts, different lighting conditions, different distances, and visual angles from the observer and so on. Objects are also often partly hidden from the viewer, and at least for natural objects can come in different shapes and colors. So recognizing objects is a hugely difficult task for any visual system. Mirror symmetry is a particularly challenging visual problem because mirror reversed images share many similarities with their non-reversed counterparts. And keeping very similar things apart is very hard. One solution to this problem, and arguably an evolutionary attractive one, is to ignore it. If getting the hang of something is really difficult and effortful, or in biology speak, metabolically costly, but at the same time doesn't get you many benefits, then it pays to just not bother. So mirror invariance makes learning to recognize objects a much easier task. It is also a clear survival advantage because it enables faster responses to both or for both predators and prey. Left-right orientation is usually irrelevant for identifying an object. In the natural world, a world without Latin letters, most living and non-living things do not change their category. They do not change what they are under mirror symmetry. So a Bengali tiger remains a Bengali tiger, mirror reversed or not. Delaying recognition of predators would not have been very adaptive for our ancestors. So this may also explain why we share the phenomenon of mirror invariance with evolutionary very distant species such as pigeons, octopuses, and fishes. It is what biologists call convergent evolution. So similar evolutionary needs, for example, to identify predators as fast as possible, produce similar evolutionary solutions. Learning to read English and other Latin-based writing systems therefore requires to overcome this evolutionary ancient and cross-species mechanism of mirror invariance. In a way, in order to read English, we have to unlearn what we've learned in early childhood, namely to ignore mirror differences. Reading and writing English entails learning to discriminate mirror images. A lowercase b is not the same as a lowercase d. In other words, mirror invariance is very helpful, but suddenly, when you want to learn to read and write a Latin-based writing system, it becomes a big problem. In contrast to mirror image discriminations, 180 degrees plane rotation, so that's lowercase u versus lowercase n, and 90 degrees plane rotations, so that's uppercase N versus uppercase Z, can be discriminated easily without any training. This is interesting 
because both plane rotations and mirror images must be discriminated for you to be able to read and write Latin-based writing systems. The reason why discrimination of D versus B requires a substantial training, but U versus N does not, lies also in our evolutionary history. Our visual system is sensitive to spot plane rotations because discriminating them has been very important in our evolutionary history. Ecological demands for vision and homo sapiens were such that it has been advantageous to discriminate up and down in 90 degrees rotations. Object recognition would be very challenging if we could not recognize objects for what they are if they're upside down or rotated by 90 degrees. And to stick with the evolution example, you, spot, you better spot the leopard hanging upside down in a tree, but distinguishing its left from its right side, on the other hand, is not so important. Evolutionary demands are the likely reason by a major neural pathway in the human visual system, the ventral visual pathway became sensitive to make discriminations between plane rotations, but not mirror images. It is therefore no challenge to distinguish U from N when first learning to read an alphabetic script like English, but it clearly is to distinguish D from B. The difference between U and N and D and B shows that's a visual problem and not a memory problem. From a general memory form point of view, there's no reason why storing the exact visual form of D in your mind should be more difficult than storing U. Another sign that it's not a memory problem is that mirror image discrimination generalizes to mirror letters that do not exist. So once you have acquired mirror image discrimination abilities, you have no problem in distinguishing uppercase R from its mirror reversed version, even though it's not the letter in English. And it is very unlikely that you have encountered the mirror reversed visual form of R before, so that mirror reversed image is unlikely to have been stored in your memory. So it is a visual image discrimination problem. And the reason why preliterate children and illiterate adults find distinguishing mirror images very hard in many different tasks, including card sorting, visual search, and same different matching. Now, does breaking mirror invariance depend on the writing system that is learned? One possibility would be that mirror invariance is broken regardless of the particular writing system that a beginning reader is learning, and even regardless of whether the writing system contains mirror reversed letters or not. This is a possibility because the learning of a writing system requires paying careful attention to the direction and orientation of the written symbols. So writing directions can be left to right as English and Spanish and Portuguese, or right to left as in Hebrew and Arabic, or even top to bottom order right to left as in traditionally written Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. Moreover, learning letters requires paying careful attention to the orientation of a letter. No matter whether the writing system contains a mirror letter or not, <clears throat> Orientation is the defining part of the identity of the letter. Another possibility, on the other hand, is that mirror image discrimination skills are fully depending on the existence of mirror letters in the writing system. In other words, it might be that without the need to distinguish B from D and P from Q, the ability to distinguish mirror images never probably develops especially since it involves the unlearning of an evolutionary old and useful skill. In a study carried out in Chennai, in the state of Tamil Nadu in India, 
I investigated these possibilities together with Tanya Fernandez, who is a world leading expert on mirror image discrimination from the University of Lisbon, and research assistant Rodela Arunkuma, who is herself a Tamil speaker. Now, looking at Tamil as of Indian language allowed us to investigate this issue because its writing system contains no mirrored characters. I'm using the term character here because instead of, instead of letter, because the Tamil writing system, like all Indian scripts, is not strictly an alphabet, even though it specifies consonants and vowels. It is not an abjad like Arabic and Hebrew either, which are writing systems that are, are freely, that are free to entirely omit vowels in writing. So abjads do not have separate characters for vowels, but use small signs, so-called diacritics attached to the continent, a consonant. Diacritics are compulsory in contrast in so-called so, so abugidas, the type of writing system, the Tamil, and other Indian languages are written in. The Tamil is actually quite poetic about its abugida. It calls the vowels the soul and the consonants the body. So combinations of the two give 260 characters or compound letters that are referred to as soul body letters in addition to independent soul letters and body letters. Tamil teachers actually often explain compound letters as born out of the combination of mother vowels and consonant fathers. In Tamil, vowels can sometimes be written as independent letters, for example, when they appear at the beginning of a syllable. Characters in written language, the way I use it here, are there for two-dimensional shapes that are written codes for a unit of spoken language, so, such as the Tamil uh, character for the single sound K or the Tamil character for the multi multiple sound syllable key. In our study in Chennai, we asked illiterate Tamil speakers and people who could, read, who could read only Tamil and people who could read Tamil and English to take part. So there were then three groups and all three groups performed two tasks. The stimuli were English letters and identical across the tasks. Participants had to decide on each trial whether a second written stimulus was the same as the first written stimulus. The two stimuli were fully different, identical, a mirror image or a plane rotation across trial types. The key manipulation was that in one task, judging orientation was critical, but in the other one, irrelevant for successful performance. So the first task was shape-based, in which participants had to judge whether the second of two consecutive stimuli had the same shape as the first one, regardless of its orientation. In this task, the correct response to mirror images and plane rotations was that they have the same shape. The second task, however, was orientation-based. The participants had to judge whether the second stimulus was identical or different. In this task, the correct response to mirror images and plane rotations was that they were different. Illiterate adults performed quite well on the shape-based judgments even on mirror image pairs. So this is a clear demonstration of mirror invariance. They were as accurate and as and fast on mirrored as on identical trials. Biliterate adults who could read Tamil and English and thus know English mirror letters were the only group who showed a mirror cost, but only in reaction times with slower shape-based judgments on mirrored than identical trials. This shows that their brains treated mirror images and ident identical pairs differently, even in a simple shape-based task in which orientation was irrelevant. People who could read only Tamil but not English showed better explicit mirror image discrimination abilities than illiterates, 
but did neither show significant mirror costs in accuracy nor reaction time compared to identical trials. This shows that it did not fully break the mirror invariance. So they can distinguish mirror images explicitly if they have to, but incur no mirror costs when mirror discrimination when the mirror discrimination is task irrelevant. If literacy differences among the groups were due to problems in attending to orientation or difficulties with switching tasks, then this should hold for both mirror image and rotation trials, but this is not what we found. The people who could read Tamil but not English showed better mirror image discrimination skills than illiterates in the orientation task to perform not as well as the Tamil English biliterates. In contrast to the literacy related drop in performance on mirror trials relative to identical trials, there was no literacy related drop in performance on plane rotation trials. This confirms that plane rotations can be discriminated easily without any reading training. So to summarize this Tamil study then, our Tamil study shows that learning to read drains some mirror image discrimination skills, no matter whether the writing system contains mirror characters or not. This is because discrimination skills are trained when the beginning reader learns that a writing system has a specific direction. For example, that Tamil or English are written on red from left to right, or that Arabic and Hebrew are written on red from right to left. Learning to read any script also requires paying close attention to the orientation of the character because it's a crucial part of what defines a character. So learners of any script therefore get extensive practice of some of the skills that underlie mirror image discrimination. Our Tamil study, however, also shows that proficient and automatic mirror, mirror discrimination abilities only develop when the reader learns to read the script with mirror characters such as English. Learning to read and write therefore leads us to develop mirror image discrimination skills and the flawed and suboptimal design of some of the written characters, characters in our scripts even help us with this task. So thus far I have uh, discussed behavioral evidence and shown you how learning to read helps us to overcome the evolutionary ancient visual ability of mirror invariants. I will now move on to discuss how reading acquisition retunes neural networks in the brain and how this retuning affects other object recognition abilities. The brain at birth is not a blank slate. So it's a far cry from being a tabula rasa, an empty sheet of paper ready to be written on, as the ancient Greeks thought. Evolution has given us a blueprint, a general layout of the nervous system that is genetically specified. This blueprint specifies the basic layout and wiring of the brain and nervous system, but the early years of childhood are also a time of great plasticity that depends on the experience the child gets. So the old debate whether nature or nurture is more important is very, very ill-conceived. One depends on the other. So it's the evolutionary specified genetic blueprint combined with experience in a specific domain that enables us to acquire crucial abilities. The evolution of neural face recognition networks, for example, can be traced far back in primate history. Marmosets, macaques, and homo sapiens have large differences, particularly in size and the amount of folding of the cortex. Despite these differences, face recognition networks in the brains of all three species are remarkably similar in spatial layout in the cortex, and in the way the constituent parts are interrelated and arranged. 
This suggests descent with modification in line with Darwin's theory of evolution. The basic network arose from a common ancestor in a process driven by natural selection. This does not mean that every detail of the network is genetically specified. Experience again is crucial. During development, the network becomes increasingly fine-tuned to faces. Now, this the case of reading actually raises an interesting puzzle for the observation that cerebral structure is partially constrained and partially plastic. That is that an evolutionary specified genetic blueprint combined with experience in a specific domain enables us to learn. The first proper writing systems were invented less than 6,000 years ago. So this may seem a long time ago, but on an evolutionary time scale, 6,000 years are only a tiny fraction of the existence of Homo sapiens as a species. Moreover, until two to 300 years ago, reading and writing was restricted to small groups of privileged people, such as the, cl the clergy or the rich who could afford education. The vast majority of people until very recently were illiterate. So this means that the ability to read a very recent human cultural invention cannot have evolved. For evolution to have created a genetically specified network that supports the task of reading, this is far too short a time. So how then do we achieve this remarkably complex feat? And the answer to this appears to be that we co-opt existing brain circuitry that has evolved for different but nevertheless somewhat similar functions, namely visual object recognition, such as face recognition. The answer that French neuroscientists Laurent Cohen and Stan Dehaene came up with is that reading recycles existing networks in the brain that have evolved for a different but related purpose. So the idea of neuronal recycling is that cultural inventions are learnable if the skills they demand are able to fit within the pre-existing constraints of the architecture and processing principles of brain networks. This fits well with the Darwinian notion of evolution as a tinkerer. Evolution does not create new things from scratch to provide optimal solutions to achieve a particular task, but rather starts off using existing structures and functional networks for the new task. Over time, and I mean here a very long time, such specialization may result eventually in changes in the genome, but in the case of reading, because of the recency in, in, in the, of the invention of this cultural skill, this has not happened yet. Kohn and, Kohn and Dehaene argued that a cultural acquisition like reading must find its ecological niche in the brain. Such a niche is provided by brain networks whose original purpose is close enough and who are sufficiently flexible to be recycled for the new task. Now, calling this process neuronal recycling actually may not be a perfect way of putting it. It is not that the brain creates something new by converting some waste material. It is a process of diverting resources or using them in a slightly different role from the usual or original one, therefore calling it co-opting or neuronal co-opting seems more accurate. But as often as the case, the catchy name for an idea is the one that resonates with people. So I will also continue to refer to neuronal recycling here. A main component of the neuronal, neuronal recycling theory of Cohen and Dehaan is the proposal that a new function, in our case reading, results in destructive neural competition 
with the evolutionarily specified original network. They argue that because of capacity limitations in the brain, the new cultural invention invades the old network and may adversely affect the structure and functioning of the original network. So learning to read them, they suggest, leads to competition for cortical space with the neighboring face recognition network, and thus may spatially displace, at least partially, activations related to face recognition in the fusiform gyrus. Kohn and Dehan argue that this cortical invasion may lead to that the evolutionary older skill is considerably reduced or sometimes even lost. Even when the effect is less dramatic, it should have measurable negative effects. Kohn and Dehan use the word measurable here because what they mean is that they should be detectable under laboratory conditions in neuroscientific and behavioral experiments. In, in other words, if you happen to meet illiterate people, you may not notice in their everyday interactions that they are better in recognizing faces. But if they are asked to look at faces in an fMRI scanner or in a well-controlled psychological behavioral experiment, one should be able to observe such positive or for literate people, negative effects. There is, however, also another possibility. The alternative is that learning to read enhances sensitivity to faces and other visual object categories in the fusiform gyrus and neighboring regions of the brain rather than intrusively co-opting existing face recognition territory. The brain has an enormous capacity. So there are about 16 billion neurons in the cerebral cortex. It has been estimated that each voxel, which is some form of pixel of an fMRI image and a tiny part of the brain it has been estimated that every voxel contains 5.5 million neurons, 22 kilometers of dendrites, and 220 kilometers of axons. Thus, given this capacity, and although the brain at some level must be a finite system, it does not necessarily follow that different related functions must engaged by default in a destructive competition process. To put it simply, there's a lot of space and scope for plasticity and cultural learning. It is conceivable that within the constraints of neuronal recycling, a reading network develops in the brain that co-opts existing visual object recognition cortical circuitry, such as the face recognition network, without adversely affecting them. Maybe older networks get fine-tuned through the co-opting process and abilities like face recognition, but also the recognition of other objects, let's say cars and bicycles can benefit. I went to Northern India to investigate whether learning to read enhances rather than detrimentally affects visual object recognition skills. Together with Alexi Ave Adelman, a neuroimaging expert from the University of Zurich, Ramesh Mishra from the University of Hyderabad and Uttam Kumar and his team from the Center of Biomedical Research in Lucknow, India. I recruited participants from two rural villages near Lucknow in the Northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. We were very grateful that more than 90 women from the Dalit community who in the West are sometimes called untouchables, agreed to take part in our study. They all lived in two villages in a rural area about a three hour drive away from Lucknow, the state capital of Uttar Pradesh, 
situated not far from Nepal and the Himalaya mountains. We went to the remote countryside because we wanted to have some participants who, that were completely illiterate, who could not read and write at all, and some participants from exactly the same community with the same socioeconomic background, but who had learned to read. This selection procedure enabled us to ensure that any differences other than literacy between the two groups were minimized. It also enabled us to rule out with considerable confidence that, were, that there were any neurological impairments or intelligence differences between the groups that were the reason that some of the people in the villages had gone to school to learn to read and others had not. We paid about 30 illiterate Dalit women in their early 30s who were all Hindi speakers to take part in a six month program in which they learned to read and write Devanagari script. Some of the illiterate people knew a few Devanagari aksharas, but many could not even identify a single of these Devanagari letters. We were thankful that two other groups, also about 30 Dalit people each took part. So one group could read and write. The other group consisted of illiterate people who did not join the reading program. Well, all three groups went through careful behavioral testing and their brains were scanned six months apart, which meant for the illiterate people who learned to read that their brains were scanned before and after the reading program. This um, powerful experimental design of the study allowed us to assess the influence of learning to read on the brain cross-sectionally, that is comparing readers with non-readers, but also longitudinally, that is assessing the influence of learning to read in the same people, the same brains. We observed as previous research with readers of different writing systems, a functional reorganization of left lateralized neural networks in visual areas, including the visual word form area in readers. Our study therefore confirmed the basic tenet of neuronal recycling theory that learning to read co-opts ancient visual object recognition networks that have in place most of the neural processing capacity required to support this new culturally invented function. In the group of people who learned to read Devanagari script in the reading program, we also observed that in the early stages of reading acquisition, good readers made use of a broader visual network beyond the one typically involved in orthographic processing. So this suggests that beginning readers recruit broader neural networks until their reading network becomes fine-tuned in expert readers. Our main question, however, was to investigate whether this co-opting of pre-existing cortical mechanism, mechanisms induces spatial cortical competition with the other object recognition networks such as the one for face recognition, or in contrast, enhances brain responses to other visual categories in early visual areas of the brain. We found no evidence that learning to read and the subsequent development of the visual word from area encroached upon the territory sensitive to faces and other visual objects. So our results strongly suggest that literacy does not cannibalize the neural territory of its neighbors as French neuroscientists Cohen and Dehan had proposed. In contrast, we observed that learning to read enhances visual responses to other visual object categories, including faces. In other words, reading acquisition does not result in destructive competition but in, but in what we may call superposition. That is the processing of written visual forms is overlaid upon older visual object recognition networks 
and recruits neural populations in a similar way without adversely affecting other visual skills. So our Lupno study that showed that neuronal recycling in the brain results in fine tuning rather than partial destruction of neural circuitry. But what effects does this neuronal recycling in the brain have on human behavior? So as for the mirror image discrimination study, together with Rudola Aronkuma, Jeroen van Paridon, and Markus Ostrek from the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics, I conducted a large scale study in Chennai with Tamil participants of varying literacy levels, ranging from completely illiterate to highly literate individuals. And um, behavioral studies are crucial here. First, they are important to explore what effects this neuronal recycling in the brain actually has on abilities such as face recognition. In other words, do non-readers perform better or worse than readers in experiments testing their face recognition abilities? And second, it is pivotal to look at a theoretical question, namely does neuronal recycling result in destructive competition or fine tuning of general object recognition me mechanisms from a different angle. The destructive competition account, according to Cohen and Dahan, predicts that learning to read leads to small losses in perceptual and cognitive abilities due to competition of the new cultural ability with the evolutionary older function in the relevant cortical regions. Our own fine tuning account, in contrast, predicts that the enhanced training of low level visual circuits on complex visual stimuli during reading acquisition also aids recognition in other visual categories. Thus, in line with the destructive competition theory, readers should be worse than non-readers, but in line with the fine tuning account, readers should be better than non-readers to recognize faces and other everyday visual objects. So a note of caution here on the strength of the effect. Again, both theories don't predict that you would notice any dramatic difference in the abilities of literates and illiterates to recognize faces. What is expected, however, is that there are small losses or gains in these visual abilities that can be robustly detected in psychological experiments. So we tested object recognition memory of different categories, which were faces, cars, and bicycle, bicycles in a study with over 90 illiterates, low literates, and literates of Tamil script. We used the Cambridge face memory task, the Cambridge car memory task, and the Cambridge bicycle memory task which are standardized tasks that have been carefully developed and successfully used to assess object recognition memory. Participants in these tasks see arrays of six objects, which were faces, bicycles, or cars in separate blocks and are then presented with three items, one of which appeared in the previous six object arrays. And the task of the participants was then to select, to select that item that they had previously seen. We also gave participants a memory test, the standardized digit, digit span task, and a nonverbal intelligence task, Raven's progressive matrices. We found in previous studies that learning to read actually improves memory and also leads to higher scores in whatever intelligence tests such as Raven's measure. 
However, despite that poverty and other socioeconomic factors are the main reasons for illiteracy in India, we cannot conclusively rule out that literacy unrelated general cognitive abilities and familiarity with formal test-taking test settings partially explain participants' IQ, digit span, and reading scores. We solved this issue statistically by regressing out common variants attributable to general cognitive abilities and familiarity with test taking, while at the same time preserving the variance that is uniquely associated with literacy. So this new adjusted reading score was no longer correlated with the cognitive ability measures, but still, co uh, but still strongly correlated with the original unadjusted reading score. And in the experiment, we observed that higher reading scores were associated with higher object recognition memory scores. And this was the case both for the raw and the adjusted reading scores. Therefore, even when taking out the variants that we could attribute to general cognitive capacity and test taking familiarity, we observed that literacy was associated with better object, including face recognition skills. So this means that the better object recognition abilities of literates are highly likely to be directly related to reading acquisition and are not a secondary effect of literacy and education on memory, IQ, and familiarity with test taking. These behavioral findings are incompatible with destructive competition and consistent with our previous neuroimaging evidence that learning to read fine tunes object recognition mechanisms, namely increased sensitivity to visual stimuli. The destructive competition hypothesis views the brain as a system with finite processing resources that different functions are competing for. Our neuroimaging evidence, together with the findings of the behavioral object recognition experiment, lead to a different conclusion, namely that a remarkable capacity of the brain is to support new abilities in such a way that related older abilities can be enhanced rather than impaired. So to, con con to conclude my talk here, a defining characteristic of Homo sapiens as a species is its ability to invent and culturally transmit technologies that have transformed life on earth. Written language, one such human cultural invention is far too recent for dedicated cognitive processing routines as well as neural infrastructure to have evolved in its service. In regard to visual abilities, so the topic of my talk here, learning to read is like putting on some magic glasses. Deciphering the visual code of writing sharpens your visual skills. Reading acquisition requires the unlearning of the evolutionary old and cross species mechanism of mirror invariance that is to overcome the tendency to process mirror images as equivalent. Learning to read recycles evolutionarily all the circuits in the brain that have originally evolved for different but similar functions such as face recognition. But this neuronal co-opting does not adversely affect visual abilities such as face recognition and literates as previously had been thought but instead fine tunes general object recognition mechanisms. And finally, I would like to thank my collaborators. And last but not least, the awesome illiterate and literate people of India. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Falk, for this great talk. I loved it, especially the conclusions you have been reaching that show that uh, an anthropomorphic vision is not really an impairment, but it's even an enhancement of this object recognition mechanism. Great. Um, there are a few questions for you, several comments on the chat, which you can uh, read later, but um, some people complimenting and also making comments. Uh, and there are a few questions, which uh, I'll be happy to read for you now. Uh, there's a question by Vitor Nobrega, who is a linguist, a Brazilian linguist who works on morphology and is interested in the field of uh, language evolution. So Vitor says, um, I'm wondering whether you have already considered a set of prehistoric engravings produced by different hominid species, which seem to indicate a proclivity to represent non-figurative patterns going back to at least 500,000 years, similar to a certain extent to what we observe in modern day writing systems. For example, the catalog of prehistoric representations of Genevieve von Petzinger in the works of Derek Hodgson. Um, I didn't understand you quite well acoustically, but um, she's asking about prehistoric or precursors of writings, right? That's right. Yes, engravings that different hominid species and that have been studied. If you yeah. have ever had a chance to consider these uh, drawings, the cave paintings, uh, which he says, uh, to a certain extent, maybe show what we observe in modern day writing systems? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. And I think it's also a very complicated issue because it, it goes to the question, you know, that our writing systems and their precursors have been optimized to, you know, towards the shapes that they have and people have all sorts of different ideas about it. Um, um, but I think there's a lot of complexity here and lots of incidentally incidental influences that you know, had an influence on what kind of writing systems we end up with. And um, I think there's what kind of research would be kind of interesting in, in, in would be interesting and to do is to uh, have a close look like at what shapes would be actually optimal, you know, for, for any new writing system. And I, I, I think there's a lot of scope here, but, um, but, but what of course is the main problem is that people don't want to change the writing systems any longer, so there is a lot of resistance into improving on, on, on the system. So I think it's an interesting but difficult uh, question to answer. Maybe she can clarify it in an email to me because I think it's more about precursors and how they have, um, how they contributed to current writing systems, as I understand. Right. Okay, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's another question also by Amanda Post. She says, um, well, she compliments you. She says she's had the privilege of attending your talks before at the MPI. And uh, well, first she has a clarification question concerning one of the studies you showed. The, um, she says, how was the in-between image created, the blur image and the mirror image discrimination task? Um, the blurred image, she says. Uh, she says, yeah, she's wondering about the So blurred there's image. always a mask, so there's one. I so, think so. So there's the, the image presented and there's a mask for mm -hmm. experimental reason and then the, the second stimulus comes. And then the task of the participants was 
you know, to judge it, whether it was identical or whether, it's the, whether it was the same, ignoring the orientation. So the, so the mask is always, you know, something that is important so that there's not an after image or these kind of things that might influence participants' responses. So that's how I understand her question. That's right. Yeah, I, th I think so, me too. Good, thank you. Uh, there's also another question by Mayusi Mota, who is a professor at the University, a Federal University in the South, Santa Catarina. Uh, she says, Professor Hutig, thank you for the great talk. Could you expand a bit on possible culture effects on object recognition in literates? Um. She would like me to expand a bit on Expand a little bit, yes, and give you the chance to talk a little bit more on these effects in the literature. Yeah, so as I said, the, the theories are quite um, interesting because it, it, the way that Cohen and Dahan had proposed the theories actually suggested that maybe object recognition abilities would be the one thing where illiterates are actually better than literates and or where reading and writing actually would have some uh, detrimental effect. But you know, from what we find, this is not the case. But in general, also what we find is that the more abstract visual objects are, the more difficult it gets for illiterates. So there are experiments, for example, in where, where, uh, where people have to name objects. And if illiterates have to name like line drawings, they are, they are much worse than literates, but they are less bad, so to speak, if, the, if they have to name color pictures. So the more it's, in the, it's close to the, normal experience to their normal life, the, the better illiterates are in their object recognition abilities. So one of the things that we know illiterate, uh, literacy does is that we learn to abstract on all sorts of, in all sorts of different ways in all sorts of different cognitive and perceptual abilities. And that means the more abstract visual object depictions are, the bigger the difficulties illiterate people have with those, right? Okay, I think um, that's about it in terms of questions. Many people are thanking you for a great talk. Um, well, there's still an, a last question maybe uh, by Amanda Post. Depending on how the mask is created, it could influence the recognition of the target. That's why I ask it how it was created, if you agree with this. That's oh, the, the, the previous question. Yeah. I see. So the mask is something that Tanya Fernandez, my collaborator here from the University of Lisbon, so she's the She's a mirror image discrimination expert and has done lots of these experiments previously, also with illiterate people in Portugal or people who have dyslexia and so on. So we used uh, the same kind of mask that she has used in her previous research and that you know have been found to be appropriate. But I could pass on the a uh, question to uh, Tanya. So if she wants to send me and Tanya an email, then we can answer mm -hmm. that precisely. Sure, thank you. I can pass it to her. Yeah. Okay. Uh, would you like to say something else just at the end of the talk? Well, I would like to thank you and the association again for the invitation. So I think it's a great series. So there have been many very interesting talks. So I, you know, I suggest that you keep going with this amazing series. And so we, so it shows that there can be good things coming out of you know terrible situations. So this online series is clearly one very good thing that you know has happened in the last one or two years so that's great so thank you
Thank you again. I mean, you, many people followed your talk online and this will remain online so people can still benefit from your beautiful talk. Thank okay. you very much again. Have a beautiful day. Bye-bye. Bye. All right.